at the famous 85th General Congregation of the Vatican Council, July 13, 1870, Bishop Strassmeyer delivered a vigorous defense of his position, extracts of which we shall quote as a brilliant summarization and critique of the massive folly of papal infallibility. Well, venerable brethren, here history raises its voice to assure us that some popes have erred. You may protest against it or deny it as you please, but I will prove it. Pope Victor, 192, first approved of Montanism, and then condemned it. Marcellinus, 296-303, was an idolater. He entered into the temple of Vesta and offered incense to the goddess. You will say that it was an act of weakness, but I answer, a vicar of Jesus Christ dies rather than become an apostate. Liberius, 358, consented to the condemnation of Athanasius and made a profession of Arianism that he might be recalled from his exile and reinstated in his see. Honorius, 625, adhered to month elitism. Father Gratry has proved it to demonstration. Gregory I, 785-90, calls anyone Antichrist who takes the name of Universal Bishop, and contrarywise, Boniface III, 607 to 609, made the patricide Emperor Phocas confer that title upon him. Paschal II, 1088 to 1099, and Eugenius III, 1145 to 1153, authorized dueling. Julius II, 1509, and Pius IV, 1560, forbade it. Eugenius IV, 1432 to 1439, approved the Council of Basel and the restitution of the chalice to the Church of Bohemia. Pius II, 1458, revoked the concession. Hadrian II, 867 to 872, declared civil marriages to be valid. Pius VII, 1800 to 1823, condemned them. Sixtus V, 1585 to 1590, published an edition of the Bible, and by a bull recommended it to be read. Pius VII condemned the reading of it. Clement XIV, 1769 to 1774, abolished the order of the Jesuits, permitted by Paul III, and Pius VII reestablished it. Pope Vigilius, 538, purchased the papacy from Belisarius, lieutenant of the Emperor Justinian. Pope Eugenius III, fourth and original, 1145, imitated Vigilius. Saint Bernard, the bright star of his age, reproves the Pope, saying to him, Can you show me in this great city of Rome anyone who would receive you as Pope if they had not received gold or silver for it? You know the history of Formosus too well for me to add to it. Stephen the Eleventh caused his body to be exhumed. Dressed in his pontifical robes, he made the fingers which he used for giving the benediction to be cut off, and then had them thrown into the Tiber, declaring him to be a perjurer and illegitimate. He was then imprisoned by the people, poisoned and strangled. Look how matters were readjusted. Romanus, successor to Stephen, and after him, John the Tenth, rehabilitated the memory of Formosus. But you will tell me these are fables, not history. Fables. Go, Monsignori, to the Vatican Library and read Platina, the historian of the papacy, and the annals of Baronius, A.D. 897. These are facts which, for the honor of the Holy See, we would wish to ignore. I go on. The learned Cardinal Baronius, speaking of the papal court, says, Give attention, my venerable brethren, to these words. What did the Roman Church appear in those days? How infamous! Only all powerful courtesans governing in Rome. It was they who gave, exchanged, and took bishoprics. And honorable to relate, they got their lovers, the false popes, put on the throne of St. Peter, Baronius, A.D. 912. Look now, the greatest number of these antipopes appear in the genealogical tree of the papacy, 
and it must have been this absurdity that Baronius described, because Genobardo, the great flatterer of the popes, had dared to say in his chronicles, A.D. 901, This century is unfortunate. As for nearly 150 years, the popes have fallen from all the virtues of their predecessors and have become apostates rather than apostles. I can understand how the illustrious Baronius must have blushed when he narrated the acts of these Roman popes. Speaking of John XI, 931, natural son of Pope Sergius and of Morosia, he wrote these words in his annals. The holy church that is, the Roman, has been vilely trampled on by such a monster. John the Twelfth, 956, elected pope at the age of 18 through the influence of courtesans, was not one whit better than his predecessor. I grieve, my venerable brethren, to stir up so much filth. I am silent on Alexander the Sixth, father and lover of Lucretia. I turn away from John the 23rd, 1410, who because of simony and immorality was deposed by the Holy Ecumenical Council of Constance. I do not speak of schisms which have dishonored the church. In those unfortunate days, the See of Rome was occupied by two competitors and sometimes even by three. Which of these are the true Pope? Could you do it, decree an infallibility, and maintain that avaricious, incestuous, murdering, simoniacal popes have been vicars of Jesus Christ? O venerable brethren, to maintain such an enormity would be to betray Christ worse than Judas. Let us turn to the teaching of the apostles, since without that we have only errors, darkness, and false traditions. What must I do to be saved? When we have decided that, we shall have laid the foundation of our dogmatic system firm and immovable on the rock, lasting and incorruptible of the divinely inspired scriptures. Do not let them make Pius the Ninth a god, as we have made a goddess of the Blessed Virgin. Stop, stop, venerable brethren, on the odious and ridiculous incline on which you have placed yourselves. Save the church from Dear higher power guy, or, or gal, his name is Jesus. So, I'm not stuck by any bunch of words at any time, Rob. I'm not limited to the Bible, Rob, because I'm not limited to Scripture. And that, I don't feel comfortable with that. Catholic apologist Tim Staples has stated that only ex-Catholics are in danger of hell. Now, faithful Catholics are expected to, for their salvation, of course, adhere to the dogmas of the church. Prior to 1950 AD, a Catholic could be saved without any regard whatsoever for the concept of the Assumption of Mary. However, in 1950 AD, that is a full 1,950 years after the time of Jesus. 1950 AD, Mary's assumption was proclaimed a dogma. Therefore, after 1950 AD, a Catholic cannot be saved without adherence to the assumption of Mary. Therefore, Catholicism has changed the gospel, has changed the way of salvation. It was different prior to 1950 AD than it was after 1950 AD. They have added to, they have added requirements. And this is only one example. But this is a clear and obvious one. Prior to 1950, you could be saved without regards to the assumption. After 1950, it was a requirement for salvation to adhere to it.